All right, we're here. One of the best to do it. Nick Roush, you know him, Kentucky Sports Radio, 11 personnel. And what a hell of a time to get Nick here with uh, Kentucky football in shambles. How's it going, Nick? Uh, it's, it's not good. It's not great. It's been a rough week. And the thing is, Mike, is each week – it's it's pretty easy to turn the page once you get to like Tuesday or Wednesday. And I would even say that after a bad loss, you want to turn the page even quicker. But number one, Georgia is is who you're turning the page to. So things things are looking bleak uh, right now in Boogie Blue Nation. Right, and I told you I got a prop. Here it is. This is the best thing I think Mark Stoops has done in years. This oh, is RD1. I am a, I am a fan. And and it is eleven o'clock, or excuse me, nine o'clock in the morning here. But I'm gonna drink one here to Mark Stoops because I think we're gonna be saying goodbye to him. So that's gonna lead to my next question here, Nick. <laughs> is it time for Kentucky to pony up? And of course, I'm talking about his buyout. Um, I, I do not think they will be ponying up. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you putting the bottoms up there this early <laughs> in the morning. I'm I'm sure most Kentucky fans. Uh, did just that this weekend. <laughs> the thing is, is uh, unfortunately, we're it, it's not such a different story than what many people were saying about John Calipari, where a lot of the frustrations are you're not winning the big games that you want to win. For Cal, it was NCAA tournament, and then CBS Sports Classic, Champions Classic. Those kind of big marquee matchups. Well, now Stoops is three and seven in his last ten SEC home games. The days where you, you you show up to the stadium, you tailgate, you spend a lot of money, you're having a good day, and you don't get the payout. Kentucky fans haven't get, been getting the payout. Meanwhile, if, you, if you're if you wanting to look elsewhere, it comes with a big buyout. So I, I, I think that's certainly out of the question. If you do want to move on, there's still a lot of football to be played this year. As daunting as the task may be to, to beat a Tennessee or a Georgia or an Ole Miss or a Texas, you win one of those in the South Carolina game, you, you kind of forget about it. So there's a lot to be played. But ultimately, if Stoops isn't the coach this time a year from now, it's it's most likely under his own volition. Uh, and that's why I, I'm, I'm not anticipating any significant changes. But it's only week two. A lot can change between now and uh, December. So, so what was the worst part of last Saturday? Because, again, we, we forget so quickly – but Kentucky was a double-digit favorite. Is it because they were a favorite, because it was at home? Was it because college game day was headed there this week for Georgia? Was it because it's sh- freaking Shane Beamer in the sunglass bowl? I mean, it's just it's kind of disrespect all the way around. What What's the worst aspect of this, what was it, 31-6 to six loss, non, non-competitive there in the fourth quarter? What was the worst aspect of, the, of this loss? Sadly, it's it's none of the above. It's that going into this game, you knew that South Carolina's pass rush with Dylan Stewart could be a problem, but you didn't think it could get so bad that you can't even call pass plays. They were pressured on 15 and 22 pass dropbacks. Like that's just that's unacceptable. And then the the worst part of it all is you've invested in Brock Vandegrift. What if that game ruined him, right? Like, what if that's kind of what Georgia did to DJU a couple years ago, where this this guy has so much uh, promise, he's a five-star quarterback. What if it just completely goes off the rails before anything ever gets started? That was his first SEC start, and he was seeing ghosts pretty quickly. So um, all the other ones certainly play a role. And coming onto your show after you told me at SEC Media Days, well, I, if they can't beat South Carolina, who are they going to beat? Like, we have to answer all those questions, and it sucks. It sucks so bad. Right. So what is the worst part of the, of the passing, Well, or just the offense in general? Is it is it perhaps Brock Vandegrift is a bust? I, I think it's maybe too early to say that. But uh, the offensive line, is that the biggest issue, or, or is it offensive coordinator Bush Hamden, or is it a combination of all three? For me, it's that the coaches work prepared with answers for when South Carolina did blow up the pass rush. Because that was an option going into the game, right? Like, you knew that they were going to get after you. So how do you react to that? Do you, do you call some screens? They called screens when they were on their own, like, three-yard line, but that doesn't help you anywhere. So uh, it's it's the lack of answers that they had. And thinking, like, well, what's what happens if this if history repeats itself against Georgia? You would think 
that surely the offensive line can't be any worse, but Jagger Burton was listed as doubtful in the injury report. He's unlikely to play. Uh, so you could be down a starting offensive lineman at left guard. You could be down your starting right tackle at guard. Like, in, in the part for me, Mike, that was really – that really irked me. That really pissed me off is in the preseason, they had some guys missing days here and there, and I'm asking people close to the program, hey, there's some signs here that the offensive line could be in trouble. Are you concerned at all? And every single time was, I'm not worried about the offensive line. I'm not worried about the offensive line. Well, now we're really worried about the offensive line, and there's seemingly no quick fixes. And that, But at the same time, like they could run the ball. They were opening up holes in the running game. So um, then you, you – like the offensive line is where it is because you had the coach pass away from cancer. That – that was devastating in the program. Then you get in a new guy who's supposed to to pick up the recruiting. Wolford picks up the recruiting. He signs three top 500 guys. They're all retired from football three seasons in. They're not playing college football anymore. And so you're like three years behind in offensive line recruiting. Well, what if you got to just go into like Lynn Bowden and we're just going to run it the whole time because that's all we can do? Then you set yourself behind in the receiver and quarterback recruiting. So there's a real snowball here. They got to find a way to put some chewing gum in the holes of this dam, or else uh, thing, things could get real ugly real quick here in Lexington. Well, speaking of ugly, just looking at that schedule, I mean, you got Georgia coming to town, and, and then you got Ohio. That's, I mean, that surely that's a win. But then at Ole Miss, I mean, this, these are legitimately two of the perhaps top five teams in the country. Could we be sitting here in a couple weeks and, and say, you know, is, is this going to get worse or is this going to get any better? I don't. I don't know. Well, and, and the hard part is is like what what can happen over the next month that will make Kentucky fans feel better? They're probably not going to beat Ole Miss or Georgia. They're just that's probably not going to happen. That would certainly do the case. But like even if you beat Ohio fifty to nothing. I mean, you you, had, you were beating Southern Miss thirty-one to nothing, and you were probably going to run up the score some more. So I, I I don't know what can happen that can make you feel confident, and then you enter a three-game stretch where it's really going to define the season. You got to beat Vanderbilt and Diego Pavia at home, then you go to Florida to play Billy Napier, who's going to be desperate for a win, and then Auburn comes to town, and we all know Hugh Freeze is desperate for some wins. So. It's 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 going to be hard to know like what you even have as a Kentucky football team until mid October, and that's that's hard to like for fans to get up because they got up for that South Carolina game, and then it just it withered away just like that. And do you think because uh, this struck me at the time, and I kind of made a joke about it, but maybe it's true. Mark Stoops hates Beamer so much. I mean, how how bad did it surprise you that they went for it? What was it on fourth and short at the thirty like one yard line, and they ran QB sneak and it, they didn't even get come close? Was it? Do you think that was a decision that was made just in, just in pure hatred of of Beamer and Carolina? I I think he was desperate to just give the offense a win to try to build momentum. the The problem I have with the play call it's not going for it on fourth and one usually. You do that after you get a first down or two. And maybe you're at your own 45. But like they, that was shaping up to be a slobber knocker where the defense was going to have to win you the game. And you just conceded a field goal. You just conceded three points. And he admitted afterwards that that was a mistake at the time. But I do think, at least for some Kentucky fans, even though the timing was wrong, they were probably glad that Stoops at least showed a little bit of aggression because that's, that's not really his MO. Is, is aggressive play. Well, I think that's why it struck me so, as so so strange. I mean, because, I mean, you would know better than I, but but just in the history of, of watching Mark Stoops, he's not a super aggressive guy, so why in the hell he did that, I, yeah. I'll never know. But um, And, and the, the worst, you know, to go back to all of these worst parts of it, I mean, as long as tenured coach in the SEC because he was able to, to regularly beat South Carolina and Missouri to kind of climb up that ladder, if you will. Shane Beamer's post game remarks that he he sounded like Mark Stoops a few years ago, where it was a full circle moment for him. He got offered the job the night that South Carolina lost Kentucky in the COVID year, and even though they lost that one, they've won three in a row, and really it's given him job stability. I mean, 
they were staring at the barrel of a four and eight season. And he was going to be firmly on the hot seat going in this year. And then Kentucky gives him a lifeline. Now this year, like they, he looked bad against Old Dominion. Now they got freaking college game day coming to town. So like Stoops has given Shane Beamer a lifeline. And now you can't even like that. Kentucky fans thought that they had the better program in South Carolina. You can't say that anymore because you've lost three in a row to that guy. Yeah. And then I know you're in the press conferences. Uh, I don't know if you go to the radio show or not, but uh, am I reading too much into Stoop's body language? But it, it seems like anytime he's asked about the offense, just based on, on, on body language to me, it seems like he's got no confidence in that unit. Do you think that's fair? Uh, no. And some of it, at least uh, in the radio show aspect, like, uh, Stoops isn't a beacon of enthusiasm behind the microphone at all times. Um, what I did find unusual about that press conference, though, because I'm sure your listeners aren't plugged into every single one of them, he answered one question in 10 and a half minutes. He talked for eight off the top. Mark Stoops ain't a guy who goes up there and talks for eight minutes. So he really kind of – he wanted to put his best foot forward and kind of – like I'm not trying to give excuses – Here's where our breakdowns were. Give some credit to them. But I think these are things that can be fixed. The the one the one kind of speaking engagement that really, I don't want to say threw me off, but was jarring was just, man, Bush Hamden looked shell-shocked. We, we, we still are getting to know him, right? He's only two games in to his tenure at Kentucky. But after that game, you could tell that he just did not anticipate what was happening on that field against South Carolina, he was reeling. So, and, and he's a guy, what I have gathered, he's very process-based. And so his plan, like it, it's 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 very much there. There's a plan for everything. And like all of his plan just like got lit on fire in that South Carolina game. So I'm fascinated to see what his answers will be against Georgia, particularly against that secondary that is just loaded with future pros where like – how can like his goal? He said to help get Brock's confidence back was to give him some easy throws early. How do you find those? How do you create those against Georgia? I I, I don't know. So um, I, I the the question moving forward that I don't have a good answer to is is what can you do to 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 give you something to kind of maybe build some momentum and get it going in the right direction. I don't know what the the numbers are, what exactly they may that might be, but. Uh, Kentucky fans got to see some fight against Georgia or else we're going to be in a spot we haven't been in a long time. And Mark Stoops is going to be feeling the most heat he's felt in the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And so let's go to that game. Georgia, you know, I, I think it's fair to say if you go maybe the last five years, I, I know last year was maybe the exception, but out of the, the East teams, Kentucky's played Georgia as, as well as anybody out of the East is there is there any hope that uh, again Georgia's on another level? So yeah, not yeah. not that they can like realistically pull off the upset, but that they that there's there's some keys here where, where Kentucky could have some success. Again, same deal. I mean, like you said last week, cousin Shane had fired Beamer already. He he's done now. He's go, <laughs> now he's going to Columbia just to apologize to Shane Beaver and the Gamecock fans. He's doing his walk of shame. I love it. Yeah, we, so, we, I just don't get him naked. Like, you can't do the Game of Thrones thing and have him naked walking around. Uh, he'll be rightfully thrown in jail. Right, right. So things can change quickly. I, I, again, that's if he wins, if he beats Georgia, he's let's give him a contract extension. But um, what, what are some keys that you think Kentucky could have some success against Georgia? Well, uh, offensively, like they, they did run the ball well, and if there is an area where you can probably. I don't want to say get Georgia like that. I think that's what you have to do. So, I, yes, the, defense is the one where, I, like in the years past, Kentucky covered in four straight against the Dogs, and a lot of it was because of that defense, right? So, can you create turnovers? They're getting pressure on the quarterback, and I know the Georgia offensive line. That's probably the strength of their team. I mean, they they are just so good up front. Carson Beck gets plenty of time. So, can you get a little bit of pressure on Beck, and then? I think what Kirby's going to do in this game, Mike, he is a – he respects the physicality with which Kentucky plays. So I think what he's going to do – I think he's going to challenge his running game to get right and say, listen, if we can run the ball against Kentucky, 
we can run and get the ball against anybody. They rank the rush defense is third in success rate right now nationally. One of the best run stopping units in the SEC. They've we thought it in the preseason. They've showed it so far. Can we run the ball through them? Because if we can, we'll be fine the rest of the year. And it's been inconsistent. You know, they just got Trevor Etienne back last week. So I think Kirby's going to try to run the ball. And he's one of those two who doesn't like. Like, he's not a big run-the-score-up guy either. He likes Mark Stoops quite a bit. It reminds me of how Cal used to treat Mark Fox at Georgia, where he was like, <laughs> this guy's a good coach. You know, he's a great coach. They're going to play us tough. Um, so I, I think that's why it'll probably be a little bit closer. But then when they flip the switch and Carson Beck just starts doing Carson Beck things, uh, Kentucky ranks, I think, 130th in pass completion defense, 71% through two weeks. So that's the part where things might get a little hairy at the end, but I do expect Kentucky to play hard and, you know, maybe it's close to three quarters, but if they do force some Georgia turnovers, they got to make something out of it. They had strip sacks on back-to-back plays against Lenore Sellers, couldn't follow the ball. At one point, I mean, they were a scoop, I mean, the scoop and score, there was green grass in front of them, nobody around the ball, and they couldn't even fall on it. So, you got to create some turnovers, capitalize there, and to try to make this a, a close football game. And, and what's the sense that you're getting from the fan base? Will they be? Will they show up in, in full support, uh, support? You think on Saturday for number one Georgia? I. Uh, it'll it'll. I think it'll be a fine crowd. And once the game gets here, it's the number one team in the country. You know they don't come to town often, so you're at least going to be a little bit gassed up. But if the Passing game in particular struggled. I I, I think you might hear some boo birds because we, we we got some last Saturday against South Carolina. Yeah. All right. Last yeah. thing for you, Nick. Really appreciate your time. It. How many Kentucky fans would sign up for this deal right now? Okay. Okay. The uh, Iowa coach retires. Ferentz. He's he's been you know he's over the hill. Mark Stoops takes that job. Because, and then John Summerall after a big season at Tulane comes to Kentucky. How, what percentage do you think of Kentucky fans would would sign up for that? 40, maybe higher. This week, it might be. a really good coach, right? Yeah, well, and and that's what makes this thing so tricky, is especially if you like the message board, hardcore Kentucky football community, they're just salivating over Summerall. They want something different. They're tired of watching bad passing offenses. And even though they lost to Kansas State, they covered, it was close, and they had a quarterback who was a true freshman throw for 350 yards in that game. So, uh, for the hardcore message board online community, it's probably like 60 or 70%. But I do think the overall Kentucky fan base that you know is, is a, a little bit more casual, it, it, it's, it's probably much lower because Mark Stoops has given Kentucky football consistency, which has never been the case in my lifetime. We've had a couple good three- or four-year run, runs here and there. But never something like this. Now, you might say, well, they aren't beating any good teams and blah, blah, blah. And you you can play that whole game. But consistently being, playing winning football, and you know you might have a Georgia blowout here or there. But you, you go into every single Saturday thinking you can win. That hasn't been the case for a long time. So I, I think for the most part, um, the, the overall approval rating, like most aren't going to take that deal. But the online community, man. If Summerall plays well this weekend against Oklahoma, which that's a, that's a live barking dog in Norman. I'm, I'm sure the, the fans in Oklahoma, they're getting a little antsy. They're wondering when the hell that offense is going to turn things on. Um, the John Summerall dynamic in all of this is going to be fascinating to watch unfold over the next few months. Right, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. If they, uh, Just imagine Tulane beats Oklahoma, which I don't think that's super far-fetched. And and Kentucky loses by a wide lo- margin this weekend. That's it. That's just going to get louder and louder. You know. Oh, what? and there's a real fear too that, you know, what if this this which SEC job opens up? Like we can't get beat to the finish line because right. he was going to be the first guy called if Stoops left for A and M. Like if that didn't fall apart, like Summerall's the coach right now. So like he's kind of your next man up, and if he gets taken somewhere else, then you're like. Uh, what do we do? So that's that's just that whole dynamic is uh ooh, ooh, that's is good. If, if nothing else, it might get ugly, but things will certainly stay interesting in Lexington, Kentucky. 
Oh wait, I apologize. I thought of one more because I was I was listening to Eleven Personnel. Give it a plug here. So fantastic. I think it's the best Kentucky show out there. If you're just talking Kentucky football, and you had a take which I thought was hilarious, and I kind of you had me, you locked me in. There are no good, great players with goggles. Are are you are you willing to amend that uh, uh, that that logic after last week? I still don't think he's that good. <laughs> I mean, three. <laughs> he had three plays that, Mike, you and I could have made those throws. I mean, there was nobody around him, and he ran the ball okay, but I still just, it's not like I'm afraid that Lenore Sellers is going to turn into this un unstoppable force. He's going to be South Carolina's Tebow. Like, he right. might be fine. I mean, the other thing, too, Rocket Sanders didn't look like the Rocket he used to be. But I, I can't say too many bad things because it kicked our ass. <laughs> it kicked our ass. It was ugly. It was bad. It was brutal. And I just got to eat Shane Beamer Crow for another <laughs> year. It is uh, – and my stomach, I'm, I'm nauseous just thinking about it, but it sucks. It doesn't feel good to be a Kentucky football fan right now. Well, there is a portion of the uh, South Carolina online fan base that is like – they have honed in on the fact that with those goggles, he cannot see periphery. So it's like – that they really think it's a disadvantage. They need they want him to abandon them. But um, I, I just think that's fantastic. Before you go, Nick, tell my audience, how can they follow you? How can they find all your work? I'm at Roush KSR on Twitter, R-O-U-S-H. And we're putting up plenty of stuff on the Kentucky Sports Radio YouTube channel. So go give us a subscribe. I know you're subscribed to that SEC podcast. And we appreciate you checking us out and enjoying all the schadenfreude uh, throughout this 2024 season. And I can't recommend his Twitter enough. It's it's much more. It is obviously heavily Kentucky based, but uh, man, he knows how to needle any fan base like the like the as about as well as I do. I mean, all <laughs> all Miss fans really took the pay when I said that <laughs> Kentucky's everybody's Super Bowl because they're doing a stripe out. Like, guys, come on, come on, I'm not being serious here. Oh.